So this is going to be the podcast uh, edition number 10 uh, of the Pythagorean Order of Death POD podcast. Uh, I, of course, am your host, Reverend uh, Jonathan Barlow G. Uh, and this will be my eighth installment of an ask me anything uh on this uh podcast and the fifth with questions provided by andrus lux so let's get right down into uh the questions of the day uh his first question is what are dreams when the body gets tired and needs to recharge itself it shuts down conscious functionality and goes into sleep mode. This allows the body to conserve energy and to regenerate its depleted stores from the previous day's work. In this sense, the body does essentially what a single nerve cell does within the larger neural network. A nerve allows 90% of the electrochemical charge to pass along its myelin sheath, but 10% it keeps behind. Freud attributed consciousness to the occasional hypercathexis of this extra 10% of electrochemical transduction, saying that as this charge built up in each neuron before being released, it cumulatively amounted to prototypical sentience. So the body in sleep does not stop this process of hypercathexis in the brain, but it does deprive it of external sensory stimulation. In the same way a fully awake and sober person, after spending some small time in a sensory deprivation tank, will experience waking dreams or audiovisual hallucinations that are largely guided by their own imagination and also be able to access information the conscious mind may usually overlook, information otherwise buried in the so-called subconscious mind instead. So, Freud proposed, dreams originate in the subconscious. In other words, while the body is deprived of external st sensory stimuli, the awareness of the mind begins to relax and exceed the limitations of its usual confines in the waking world, limitations placed on one's imagination by the conditions of their immediately present situation and the need for basic survival, etc. In this condition of most extreme open-mindedness, it is possible for the quantum supercomputer that is the brain to calculate probabilities it could not otherwise even fathom, and thus dreams are often accurately premonitory. His next question is, is dream interpretation real? It depends on the dream and the interpreter. I've found people are much more astute analyzers of their own dreams than most other people could be for them. Most people's dreams reflect their current emotional stress level on the subconscious and unconscious levels. Usually dreams of dying or repeated false awakenings in dreams within dreams indicates severe levels of repressed and often unidentified stress of a chronic and usually deeply personal degree. Lucid dreaming is also possible. However, sustaining it for any prolonged duration has proven difficult even to those who attain and practice lucidity. In such dreams, one can easily fly, so interpretation of lucid dreams becomes pointless. What are synchronicities, and does the phenomena have legitimate meaning? Synchronicities are, succinctly, 
meaningful coincidences. For a synchronicity to be distinct from a simple coincidence requires the presence of an objective observer to perceive the implied meaning of the coincidence. A coincidence can occur with no observer. A single final snowflake may start a vast avalanche, and a tree may fall in the woods, even if no one is around to see or hear it doing so. <coughs> However, a synchronicity, by definition, requires an objective observer to impute their own connotations onto an event, thus rendering it, philosophically, subjective to their psyche. So, clearly, interpretation of the meaning of any synchronicity is subjective, even if the apparent occurrence of a synchronicity may seem undeniable. Many do what is currently called following synchronicities, where they seek to not only find a single coincidence meaningful, but a whole string of them, as if a series of carefully placed clues leading them along to some hidden treasure at the end of a great adventure. So one may have a run of luck that is either good or bad, but this is strictly from the perspective of the individual. Either way, the house always wins. Likewise, one may follow a string of synchronicities, sometimes called going down a rabbit hole, but where one will ultimately end up becomes increasingly unpredictable. So synchronicities are, essentially, psychosomatic, being based on confirmation bias for identification and a self-fulfilling prophecy for discovery. That being said, however, it is possible that there exists what Jung identified as an a-causal connecting principle operating at right angles, his prediction, to ordinary cause and effect. In truth, fourth spatial dimensional metaform shapes pass through us invisibly as microgravity waves of faster-than-light tachyons all the time, and we do not even notice. These fourth spatial dimensional shapes can connect one location in space-time to another location at a vast distance and or duration away. In this sense, it is not impossible that there may be a higher dimensional sentient life form or entity that guides people's choices through subtle subliminal messaging and synchronicities occurring just around the periphery of their perception. Now, whether such an entity would be good or evil depends, again, entirely on one's personal point of view. Whether such an entity exists in any tangible sense is also irrelevant, because it is the product of chasing synchronicities that are themselves superstition to begin with. The idea of one's luck being influenced by the fates or by any forces greater than one's own free will is simply a dodge to avoid accepting personal responsibility for one's own actions. Likewise, looking for synchronicities makes them easier to discover. His next question. At a guess, man will figure out the physical brain, but will consciousness evade our understanding? The brain is like a car engine. When it doesn't have any gas, the car engine cannot run, but when it has gas, it can. Just so, when there is electricity in the nervous system, the person is alive. And when there is not, they are dead. That is why when people's hearts stop, they can often be brought back to life by a defibrillator, a device that induces a strong electromagnetic pulse to shock the heart back into its normal functionality. This means of tricking death is, of course, not a permanent cure. You cannot, so far as I know, resuscitate a dead body by any amount of electrical voltage 
after the brain has been deprived of oxygen long enough for its cells to suffocate, around 8 to 10 minutes. So, essentially, consciousness is a process of the electrochemical nervous system interacting with the photoelectric force. Theoretically, consciousness can outlive the body's death, but it would still require a vessel to carry its memories, willpower, and imagination in, just as the idea of the Merkaba in Kabbalah, a computer network in transhumanism, or just a soul in most religious belief systems founded on mysticism. His next question. On this never-ending quest of evolution, what is our final form? if there is one. I do not know if there is a final stage to evolution. However, I do know that there are potential stages beyond our present human form. I believe we are all naturally born telepathic, but that society conditions us to pretend this is just a false belief. Therefore, Humanity is already in a state of contrived neoteny, where mankind's natural psychic powers are artificially suppressed. Therefore, the next obvious stage of evolution likely for mankind is regaining our psi potential, giving us the ability to read each other's minds, to communicate non-verbally to other species of animal, to understand the expressions of plants, to decode the long-lost messages encrypted in the hexagonal cells of quartz crystals, and etc. Following such mind reading comes, via mind writing or mind control, telekinesis, the ability to move inanimate objects with your mind alone. Beyond this, at some distant point in humanity's future, comes mental-only, instantaneous manifestation, the ability to manipulate matter energy from a sub-quantum level, allowing for teleportation, rearrangement of present elements, and the combination of both these abilities, all to allow the existing biology of the human brain to project or broadcast its mind-over-matter signal and make something out of nothing. Up to the point of subquantum manifestation, we are already currently designing robots that could be capable of supplementing or substituting for our own brain waves involvement in, in this process. However, what lies beyond even this level remains the stuff of inspirational fiction, namely the soul. A soul, the aura of the living body can become detached from its host and astral travel in its form as an Atman or energy double. This soul can also manifest its own physical body to inhabit. At this point, the appearance of the human body becomes absolutely arbitrary and bound solely by the imagination of those souls who survive at that time. Beyond even the concept of an energy being that can manifest its own body, there remain more possibilities for evolution, but by this point the biochemical is wed to the photoelectric so much they are indistinguishable apart from one another. Theoretically, the most high life form in the local universe is the universal brain itself, that is, the structure of the intergalactic plasma filaments in the local universe resembling the neural networks of cerebral cells inside our own brains may be more than a mere coincidence and possibly indicate that the local universe itself is simply one enormous brain inside of which our own planet and everyone and everything on it is only the most minute grain of sand lost in the midst of this. In that case, hyperspace would be the equivalent for the universal brain of what the mind is for our own brains, or, more exactly, 
hyperspace is the aura or soul of the local universe, just as the ionosphere for Earth or the photosphere for the sun. This final question. If you could say something to mankind on a microphone, what would it be? In the end, we are all one. Time is like a rope comprised of many threads that has become uncoiled and frayed in its middle, but that remains strongly tethered together at either end. One end of this rope is the beginning of time, and the opposite is the end of time, and in the middle, where we are now, each thread thinks itself alone and independent of all the rest, rarely realizing its necessary place in the complex tapestry of the space-time continuum. Each thread, in this case, is like a vector or wavelength of ether energy, propelled from the beginning along an inevitable and preordained path. And such, while they skip across the surface of our little blue and green jewel of a planet, over time, we are. So that's the end of the 10th installment of the POD podcast. Uh, I, as always, uh, am Reverend Jonathan Barlow G. Uh, thank you for tuning in to everybody who did uh, in audio or video content uh, only or in both. Uh, and uh, don't forget to like, you know, thumbs it up if you're watching and you enjoyed it and uh, share it with your friends that really helps spread the information in the video. And uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe and encourage other people to subscribe to the channel. If you, and if they would like content like this uh, in their feed. So uh, thanks a lot. And uh, that's all for now. So uh have a great one. Peace.